So in the bowl, I got some porridge. So maybe like 80 to 100 grams of oats. I got about 25 grams of mixed nuts. Um, I've got, what is this in there? Blueberries, 200 grams of blueberries, frozen blueberries. And then a little bit of apple crumble, or cherry crumble, alarm me. It was just left over, so I just kind of threw it in there. Some extra carbs, easy work. It's just like oats and fruit and a bit of sugar anyway, so it's all good, only a little bit of it. And then what I'll do is mix up some whey protein with water and sludge and pour it over the top. Before I do that, the secret is adding out a dark chocolate, let it melt in, absolutely delicious. And this is like my favorite breakfast. I have it pretty much all the time. I just uh, adjust the quantities depending on my goal. So, so yeah, oats, fruit, whatever else you want in there, some nuts, brilliant, um, and then melt in some dark chocolate. Mix up some whey protein with water, just a little bit of water, make it into a sludgy paste, pour it over the top. I'll show you what that looks like now, that whey protein mix, because most people get this wrong. barely any water, tiniest little drop. Do as little as you can first, see how it turns out, keep mixing it, and then if it's still too thick, add a little bit more, but don't overdo it the first time. So it needs another little bit. nice and dark, preferably 90 but just a little. a thousand calories right there so if you're trying to lose weight probably don't want to replicate this recipe you want to maybe take out the nuts reduce the portion of the oats and potentially use a little bit less dark chocolate um, that's what I did while trying to lose weight I just had a 600 calorie version of this um, but yeah staple for my breakfast because it's delicious and it's actually quite nutritious in terms of you know giving me a lot of protein um, a lot of fiber micronutrients um, you can basically change the profile depending on on the ingredients you put in so give it a shot so here we are in my personal tracking document so this is essentially going to serve as the recap for my bjj competition prep you could say um it wasn't a it wasn't a big deal as in this wasn't a big deal diet for me or anything it wasn't a, a massive effort but i think it's illustrative of a couple of lessons that i would like people to take away um, and this is not just for people who are competing in weight class sports, because it's actually more so for people who aren't. Because um, there's a really a few important points in here that I drill home to all of my clients, and I would like you know you guys to take those lessons as well. So to to kind of recap, um, I competed in, in BJJ on Sunday, so that was Sunday, and I had decided about five weeks before that I was going to do the competition. So I was sitting a couple of kilos away from the weight class that I needed to compete in. So the weight class I needed to compete in was under 76 kilos, but that's actually with the gi. Um, so the gi is like, a, it's, it's called a kimono, in, that's like the Japanese terminology for it. Um, I call it the gi, um, and that's essentially like the big pajamas that people wear. Um, they're generally white or black, sometimes blue as well actually. Um, but yeah, they're the big pajamas people wear. You wear a big heavy top, big heavy bottoms, you wear your belt um, around your midsection, and that can weigh anywhere between like 
1.5 and 2.5 kilos most of the time. If it's a very heavy one, it's going to be closer to the top. If it's a lighter one, it's going to be, excuse me, closer to the bottom, um, naturally. So yeah, so so that that's essentially what you have to account for. So that meant that I had to get to around 74 kilos to kind of be safe um, on the day that I was going to be able to weigh in um, and under 76. So in terms of preparation for that then, it, it, it the, the, the diet essentially took two phases. So phase one is basically just the actual straight up dietary process. I should, I should call it level one, really. That's just the straight up, you know, being in a calorie deficit over the course of a number of weeks. You know what? We'll come back to the numbers in a minute. Let's actually go here first. So that's just being in a calorie deficit overall. So obviously to come from close to 79 kilos down to 73.3 kilos um, in five weeks is going to require you to be in a calorie deficit. So you have to be consuming significantly less calories than you are burning for that weight to actually go somewhere. So that's kind of the main part of it. But that doesn't actually tell the whole story. Okay, so two more things to add to that. Firstly, it's about your average calorie intake. So this was that my this meant that my average calorie intake was below um, the threshold that I would require to maintain throughout. Um, and I know most of you know this, but I just want to make sure it's clear for people. So it meant that I was eating less calories than I was burning on average across the week, across the month, across the five week period. Because what you will see is that when we do go back to the nutrition document in a minute, there's days where my calories are much higher, there's days where my calories are much lower. And that's one of the key points that I want to get across to people. And in addition to that, the more your calories are kind of fluctuating, the more you're going to see these weight fluctuations. See the way I have these normal spikes up, down, up, down, up, down, not a big deal. They're a normal part of weight loss. You expect there to be fluctuations, um, especially if you're consuming different calorie levels on different days of the week. And if you have different routines, like if you're exercising more one day, less the others, if you're in a different environment, for example, me being in college and cycling to college versus being at home in Killarney. Um, if I've gone home and maybe I'll be eating a bit more, I might be as active, etc., etc. So you've got multiple different variables that go into determining your body weight on any given, any one day. So what you don't want is to get caught up on the day to day because this is what matters. What matters is this red line that this average trend is trending downward for me to be able to lose the weight that I was required to lose. Um, the fact that there was a 78.6 here in midway and I started at 78.7, that didn't matter to me. It, it was irrelevant because I knew that things were still trending downwards. So you don't want to get caught up on the day to day, whether you're someone that's generally trying to lose fat, whether you're someone that's trying to make weight for a weight class, whatever your goal is, do not get caught up in the day to day. And this is one of the reasons that tracking your weight more regularly can sometimes be helpful because what it allows you to do is to recognize that these fluctuations are normal and you can then get average values for across, across the week and have more accurate week to week changes. Um, so yeah, so the point here being that fluctuations are normal. It's normal to see these kind of ups and downs throughout the process of weight loss or fat loss um, and that you really care most about the trend line. Now, the second thing that I wanted to touch on is that here, so from here to here and from let's say here to here, there's these big significant drops, like there are drops that are, you know, steeper than any of the others. Okay, so they're the largest drops in body weight. And what they resemble are trial, like this was a trial weight cut, and this was the proper weight cut. And what I mean by that is that the goal there was not just to lose additional body fat through being in a calorie deficit, but the goal was to actually manipulate other nutritional variables so that I could lose overall weight, okay? So not just fat, weight in general, so that I could make the weight class that I was required to compete in, okay? So this is a really, really important point. If you are a powerlifter, if you're a jiu-jitsu athlete, if you're a boxer, like whatever you do, you want to have trialed a weight cut at some point previous before doing, you know, the official one so that you know what sort of weight you can expect to lose, okay? That's really, really important. Because if you've never trialed it, then one, you don't know like what you can expect to lose. <clears throat> Two, you don't know if the process is even gonna work for you for whatever reason. 
And three, you don't know how you're going to actually feel. So you want to be able to have gone through the experience so you know what it's going to be like. So essentially what I did on the week before the competition, which was probably a bit late, but it was fine, um, was did, I, I had two days where I was eating low to no carbohydrates, so very little direct carbohydrate sources, um, low to no fiber, so no direct fiber sources, so no fruits, no vegetables, basically eating a protein and fat-based diet with very little residue, so very little fiber, very little food volume, with the intent of one, reducing the amount of muscle glycogen that was stored, um, which also tends to come with water that's stored. So that's going to be you know, a fairly significant tr contributor to your overall body weight. And two, reducing food content within the gut. So if you can get all that food out of your gut, that again is going to lead to an additional loss in body weight independent of fat loss. And that's the important point. Um, it's independent of fat loss. It's not just about the fat loss when it comes to actually making weight. Um, so yeah, that's an important point. Like water manipulation is another variable that can go in here. And I, like I did a little bit, but not very much. So essentially what I did in that trial weight cut was I basically bumped my water intake up to six to eight liters roughly, um, for two to three days prior. Um, and then on, uh, for two days prior, two days prior to the day, prior to the day <laughs> I was saying I was going to be weighing in. Um, and then on that day, uh, the day before I just kind of consumed water like casually as in I wasn't t t like I wasn't trying to be like oh I need to get more water in it was just like yeah I'll just kind of sip away leave myself a little bit below what I would normally drink um, if I wasn't trying to consume extra water uh, because I knew that I didn't need to actually like drastically restrict fluids and really like manipulate as many variables as possible it, it just wasn't something I needed to do because I knew I was close enough um, but it is something that, that you can play around with um, so yeah, so that's what I did. And I ended up going then down to 74.6 and that was one week before. And I had only done a kind of a two days at lower carbs. So I was like, oh yeah, that's no big deal. I know I'm pretty much going to be there. So then the next week when I repeated that, I knew what to expect. So I knew that, all right, my starting point this time is 76 at this spike versus like between versus let's say around 77 when I started the week before. So I was already a kilo lower. And I knew that I was going to have one extra day at low carbohydrates. So I knew that getting to, you know, 73.5 was going to be pretty easy. And on the morning of, I got to 73.3. And like, that was, that was, that was pretty damn lean for me. You know, the night before, um, like I looked like probably close to the leanest I've ever been. I'm not entirely sure, but like, you can see a photo judge for yourself. Um, but yeah, I was pretty lean. Um, but, but felt good on the day. And that's the most important thing. And, and that brings me on to, the other thing that I wanted to quick that I wanted to touch on, which I will do at the end of this next segment. So the next segment that I want to touch on is the implication for people who are just generally dieting. Okay, so you see these ups and downs. They're a normal part of the process. I ha I create some of these graphs for my clients as well, so that they can see that these fluctuations are normal. We end up having this discussion all of the time. So if we go back to so we've established that fluctuations are normal. If you're getting, if you're freaking out about day, like day to day jumps in body weight, like you're just adding an unnecessary stress to the dietary process. It's not a big problem. It's a normal part of the process. So, um, what you're going to see here is right. So week one, I wasn't tracking calories. Like the only reason I started tracking calories was so I could make this video <laughs> because I wanted to be able to illustrate this to you guys. But I wasn't tracking calories on week one. All right. So so we can just ignore that. Week two. What you'll see is my average calorie intake across the week was 2,568 calories, okay? Now, that is the average. So that is what is most important. That's what's going to be dictating whether or not I lose or gain body weight that week, okay? Like it's the primary driver. As we established, macronutrient composition, water intake, activity, etc., are going to be really important in determining like exactly what you're going to weigh in any given day. But that's going to be the, the, the biggest driver in terms of like, is my body fat going to go down or is my body fat going to go up? Okay, so that's going to be a really important variable. Now, but if you look during the week, you'll see that on Thursday, I had 2,250. Friday, 2,120. Saturday, 3,745. And Sunday, 2,150. All right. What I get from most clients when this happens, even if they've hit their average calorie intake across the week, they're freaking out about that Saturday. They think they failed. They're like, Gary, I failed you. I'm a failure. Look, I ate that. I woke up the next morning, 
Um, I'm such a failure. This is a waste of time. Look at me. I'm an awful person. It doesn't matter. All right. The only time this matters is if it's leading you to binge restrict cycles. What you don't want is to end up in a cycle where you're restricting and then you're binging and you're restricting and you're binging. But if this is planned and it's controlled, it's not a problem. So this was me on a Saturday. I believe I, on this week, I was probably out for dinner with Laura. So we went out for dinner together. We probably had a drink afterwards and probably got some dessert. And that's fine. Like that's life. That's what you want. Like, I do not want to ever be in a position where I have to say to my girlfriend, like other than for maybe short periods of time if I was competing, where I have to say to my girlfriend, um, oh no, actually, sorry, we're not going for dinner. Um, I, I can't do that. Like, that's just not how you live your life. That's not how you want to live your life. You don't want to have to like be like, no, I can never have ice cream. No, I can never have pizza. No, I can never have my favorite beer. Like, that's just not a good way to live your life, all right? Like, for some people, some of the time, professional athlete, boom, you, you do what you need to do, right? Professional, professional competitor that needs to hit a weight class, you do what you need to do. But for, for most of us, we need to focus on our average calorie intake across the week, make sure that is at, a, at an appropriate level, and then we can go about our lives just fine. So what you'll see is that, that average level of 2568, look at the next week, 2572, four calories in the difference between the average, right? So the averages are very, very similar. But again, if we look at that following week, we're into week three of the process here, what you will see is Monday, 2150, Thursday, 3171, Saturday, 3150, Sunday, 2941. So again, we've got a massive range of about a thousand calories um, between like the lowest and the highest calorie day. And the thing is, like they're not like pre-planned as in like, oh, this is my calorie cycling plan. It's me saying that I have an average calorie target for the week. I'm comfortable fluctuating a little bit here and there because I know that some days I'm going to be a bit hungrier. I know that some days I'll have more training sessions. I know that some days I'll get food with my girlfriend, um, et cetera, et cetera. So these things happen and and that, that's life and that's fine. You know, it's not a big deal. Um, so, that, so yeah, like Monday is generally a lower calorie day for me because, you know, it's the start of the week. I'm definitely in college. Um, I might be training straight away after college and like, I'm, I'm just busy, you know, so I'm, I'm just busier on that day. On that Thursday, I had a hard, I believe that Thursday, I had a hard jujitsu session that evening. So I probably came home and had a larger meal because I was quite, you know, I was quite hungry after. Again, not a big deal. Friday was lower. Saturday was a bit higher. I think that was the week, the weekend I went for dinner with Brian O'Hengese. So again, like had a bit more food, not a big deal. The average is what counts, right? This is the point I want to drill home. Next week, similar story, 2511, okay? This was a week that took extra planning. This was a week where I had, you know, two events that were very likely to drive my calorie intake way up. And I was like, can I accept that? Yes, I can. That's a trade-off I'm willing to accept. So what did I do? I, you know, consumed less calories throughout the week. You know, I just adjusted my meal composition a little bit. It wasn't a big deal. I didn't feel like I was restricting myself, like I was starving. It was just me doing what I needed to do. So that on Friday, you know, Laura had booked a hotel in Sneem for us to go to. You know, we were going to be going for dinner. We were going to have a drink. Um, I didn't want to have to restrict myself. It made no sense. <laughs> so, yeah, I went and I enjoyed myself. And then the next day we were driving home from Sneem. Um, firstly, we had a buffet breakfast. I mean, who wants to have to reject a buffet breakfast? Um, then we went for we went to Strawberry Fields, which is a pancake place near Killarney on the way home. We've wanted to try it for ages. And I was like, yeah, I'm definitely going to have it. And then that night we went out for dinner with my family. Um, and, you know, I, have, I very, very rarely go out for dinner with my family. All my family met up. So obviously I had a lovely meal and it was a great time. So... Again, there's big fluctuation there. Like that Saturday night was 4,300 calories. Like that's a lot of calories. And they, like generally, like, am I going to advise someone that ha to have a range of 1,800 to 4,300? Like, no, not at all. But if I'm confident that the person, one, is not doing it out of like a disordered eating pattern, and two, that it's not always happening, you know, because you don't want to be like not fueling these midweek sessions so that you can binge at the weekend. Um, and three, that they're willing to accept the trade-off that, the 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 extra bit of restriction during the week is worth enjoying things enjoying time with their family at the weekend and that's all very controlled like i'm happy for someone to do that it's not that big a deal where it is more of a problem is when someone is doing it 
out of that kind of binge restrict cycle you know they're, they've got disordered more disordered eating behaviors they're having those meals and they feel like they're out of control you know they're not eating because they want to or because it's a, a social occasion and they're enjoying it they're eating because it's like a compulsive out of control behavior that's where things become a little bit more of a problem so so yeah that's that and then the final week before calorie average was a little bit lower two two three three and that was mainly driven up by the competition day itself. Obviously, I wanted to refeed quite a bit, um, not just on the morning, but throughout the day. Um, I had more food that day because I had been, you know, restricting far more during the week. So what you'll see is that I had some days at 14 to 1500 calories even, um, and body weight dropped significantly throughout that week from 76.4 down to 73.3, which is both body fat um, and non-fat um, sources of body weight. So so yeah, that gives you some insight into the process um, that unfolded over the course of that five weeks. Um, and now I'm back to not tracking anymore because I just don't need to track and enjoy not tracking. I prefer that. Um, feels a bit more human to me these days. And I think that's a skill everyone should try and develop eventually. But obviously, some period of tracking can be really beneficial. I, I add in more data here, you know, but it's it's not really something that we need to, to worry about for now, like, you know, how much I'm sleeping, the amount of steps I'm taking, and the training I've completed on any given day. But we can go through that in another video. You'll notice I didn't place much emphasis on like specific calorie and macronutrient composition um, as I was going through this, because again, it's, it's just not that important. I don't play that much. I don't... I don't pay that much attention to it because I know my protein tends to end up in a good place on average. Um, carbohydrates or fats are dictated mainly by my food preferences. But again, as you, when you're a beginner, there are types of things you might need to focus a little bit more on to learn what's in your food, to learn you know what your kind of average, your, what your preferences lead to on average, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And obviously, we've written about that and talked about that countless times. This is not the video for that. But just to come back here once more. What was I going to say? Fluctuations, normal. The average rate of loss, primarily dictated by your calorie intake. But again, you can have these additional drops as a result of some playing around with calorie or, or with your macronutrient composition, with your water intake, etc. If you'd like me to do a separate video on like the kind of physiology of that stuff, I, I don't mind. More than happy to go into it. I wanted to keep this video pretty basic. Um, and then finally, touching on like that point a little bit of, of what i might talk about in a more, a more physiology specific video um a number of people did say to me excuse me two seconds oh you know gary but if you're doing this like low these low carbohydrate days prior to your competition would you not be concerned that you know glycogen availability would be beneficial for your performance on the day um and that is a good point however it's important to recognize, I guess, all right, so my personal context, okay, so I've been doing jiu-jitsu for like seven months or so, okay, so I haven't been doing it that long, it's been kind of inconsistent in, in that time, so if you think about what the limiting factor, the limiting factor for me in doing well in a competition or rolling with anyone is going to be, like, what's it likely to be? It's going to be technical things, so it's going to be the, the more technical Brazilian jiu-jitsu specific stuff, like strength and fitness are not going to be my limiting factor, okay? And that's not because I'm very strong, but I'm or very fit, but I'm likely above average for my weight class because of my background, because I'm coming into this with a really good base of fitness and strength relative to what the average might be in a given weight class for white belts, okay? So that that's the context. The context is that I'm in a white belt division, so it's unlikely that people have been training for longer than, say, like two to three years like that's probably the longest you're going to have someone at a white belt okay so i'm doing it for about seven months so i'm kind of at the bottom and you know I'm, I'm likely to be closer to the bottom end of people who are competing so technically that's probably going to be, be my weakest point so from that perspective then trying to do everything i can to maximize you know my energy systems on the day is it going to be helpful yes like there's a, there's a benefit there but what i'm saying is that I wouldn't be as concerned um, about it as I would be if I had a lower level of fitness and I needed every last percent of that because I was pretty confident that, I, that on the day that my fitness wasn't really going to be the limiting factor. You know, it was going to be more of the things related to, you know, my ability to, to execute the techniques, to get out of particular positions, um, to know what I was doing. 
they were going to be the limiting factors. And that's not to say that there isn't an interplay between your fitness and your ability to execute techniques, because obviously if you're more fatigued, then you're not going to be able to execute techniques as well. You're going to be, you know, breathing more, more. you're going to be focusing on that stuff, etc., cetera, et cetera. Um, but I think that's clear that in my personal context, fitness was probably going to serve me pretty well and that I didn't need to worry about every last 1% um, of trying to like maximize what I'd get out of my energy systems. Um, if it was the case that someone was a BJJ athlete and they were trying to, you know, they were already, you know, quite competent at their level, they've done a few competitions and they know that they generally gas out after two or three fights, then that's something you want to focus a bit more on. But for me, I just wanted to make weight, I wanted to get some experience in, I wanted to enjoy that process, um, see how I got on. Like, it wasn't about me being like, all right, 100% at my best, got to, you know, crush this. Like, obviously, that's the attitude you go into it with. But but yeah, it was it was, it was was about the, the experience, about seeing how I got on, um, about giving some of the technical skills a shot. But the, the fitness side of things was not something I was overly concerned with. So, for example, if, if, if let's say, if let's say I had two low carbohydrate days and I compared that in an alternate universe to me having two standard carbohydrate days, let's say it made a 5% difference um, in my VO2 max or my maximum, maximum ability to endure, let's say. Okay, so your maximum endurance ability. Is that going to be like the defining characteristic of whether or not I do well on the day? Ugh, probably not. Probably not at my level, I don't think. Um, it's probably more so going to be the technical stuff, making mistakes, putting my hands in the wrong place, you know, that's that sort of stuff. So, so yeah, hopefully that makes sense, guys. Hopefully that answers the question to the people that did ask that. I can, like, I can go over this stuff in far more detail if you'd like. If you want me to pull out the whiteboard, we can talk energy systems, we can talk glycogen, we can talk about substrate utilization, we can talk about... The, the physiology of, of antidiuretic hormone and what exactly happens when we do water cuts and stuff like that. Like, I don't mind um, that stuff I'm interested in, but I want this video to be practical to give you guys some insight into the process that I undertook and hopefully you got something out of it. So what I will do is leave you with a quick clip of, that Laura got of the fight that I did have because I didn't actually mention it. Yeah, basically, so what happened on the day? Yeah, I should definitely say this first. What happened on the day? was the guy I was supposed to be fighting first was too heavy, so he didn't actually weigh in. So I technically won my first fight, but I'm obviously not saying that I won that. Like, he was just disqualified. So I went on to the next round, um, and I ended up fighting um, a really good guy who end went on to, won to win the whole thing with a record of 16 to 1. So he was pretty damn good. Um, and he submitted me in the last 10 seconds, I think, um, and someone was asking me yesterday, like, how, how did he submit you? I was like, I actually don't even know. It was, like, <laughs> it was, it was basically a, a variation of a loop choke. Um, but it wasn't a very exciting match, as in, like, I'll just show you, like, the first minute and a half. I think it's, like, a minute and a half, the clip I have. Because after that, like, it was pretty much like he was in side control. Like, we'd move around a little bit, but there wasn't a whole lot going on. Um, so I'll show you the first minute and a half. Um, I made a couple of mistakes. You know, I should have should have done better um he was obviously far far better than me but i still think that i could have i could have done better but it, it's it's good to, it's good to have made the mistakes and have a video because you're like all right i know i need to drill that now i know not to do that next time and that's a great thing about jujitsu is like you can really pinpoint where you went wrong and what you can improve and i think that's excellent like it's really enjoyable um so yeah I'm, I'm really glad i competed um i'm glad to 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 know what mistakes i made i'm glad to know what i need to work on and really looking forward to, to going back again because it was a great buzz um, very exciting um, and yeah one more thing actually that, that you will notice in the video that's quite interesting because I never thought about this before is that right so he had a he had a coach in his corner so there, there's no one there's no one shouting at me in the video so all the the person you hear shouting is shouting at the guy that I'm fighting with and fighting with uh, that rolling with whatever the terminology is competing against <laughs> What you'll notice that's really interesting is that the the coach basically is narr he's narrating the fight and saying everything that I'm about to do, and in my head what was happening right because it, it was really weird because there's one point where I'm in a quite a good position you know I'm sprawled out on top I've got my arm under like it shouldn't be impossible for me to get a guillotine from there but 
you know, his his what he shouts at the time, I think, is um, don't let him slip his hand in there. So immediately when he says that before you man even countered it, I'm like, all right, I got to move my hands. And it was the same when I was in on the bottom in side control when he was like, all right, that's all he's got. He's going to keep trying to do that. Then I didn't try and do do whatever that thing was again. Um, and yeah, it was interesting because it was just like and I never thought of that from a psychology perspective that every time he said what I was going to do, I then didn't do it, even though it was probably a good call to do that. But anyway, I'm a beginner, raw beginner, and it is all about learning these things. Um, there's obviously like, like jujitsu, jujitsu is just, it's just an endless minefield of things you could possibly learn. So it's, it's exciting from that perspective. And it's, and it's cool having done a competition and having been, you know, thrown in there and made mistakes. Cause you're like, right. I know, I know I'm going to work on that now. I know that my, my side control escapes. I know I need to work on that next time. I know that if I do compete again, um, block out what the other coach is saying. Um, I know that if I am sprawled out on top and if, if, if I'm in a good position, you don't want to give that up. I know that if he gets a De La Hiva, um, at the beginning that, you know, there, I, I, there's a couple of things I know to get out of that as opposed to, um, ending up with the positions that I did end up in. So, so yeah, um, that is that guys. Watch the video, enjoy the video. Hopefully you enjoyed this overall. If there was some useful things in here, there's app, there's implications in here for people who are generally trying to lose fat, but also people who are like trying to actually make weight for competitions. And I didn't go deep into that because one, I don't want to position myself as like a weight cut expert, um, because like I just don't want to do that. But secondly, um, excuse me. Um, if you do want me to do a more detailed video um, on some of the physiology of anything I talked about, because there are some interesting things that go on with water, water manipulation and stuff like that, uh, with glycogen availability, um, we can we can touch on some of that stuff. Um, and if you'd like me to map out more specifically, like what what the actual diet, as in foods, look like in those kind of lower carbohydrate, lower fiber days, I'm also kind of happy to do that. So. So yeah, any questions, let me know. Enjoy the video to finish off. And and yeah, um, I will catch you guys in the next video. Strong, Dara. Try to get onto your right shoulder. Get your left arm out of there. You have options here, Noah. You can sit to the guard, maybe. You can get the leg here. Good job. You have a sit out. Good job. Stay on top, heavy. Good. Now, no close guard. Good job. Really good work. Left arm, do that for you. Good, good, good. Don't sweat that leg over your back. He's going to give you a free pass here. Right arm for the head and free pass. Good, good, good. Free pass, left knee needs to get in. Good job. Working on his legs now, good. Really good, good. Put your left arm over here, left arm over here like last match. Left arm, yes, yes, yes. You gotta pass his guard like that as well. Left arm blocks his hip. Don't sweat the, don't sweat the sub, just control him first. He's looking to try to roll you again, you can feel it. It's a bit harder to get rolled from straight north-south. Good job, Noah. Well done, Darrow, and lucky bro. Stay ahead of him here, Noah. Stay with him, Noah, stay with him. Good. Good. That's all he's got from there. 